Hi, I'm Jennifer Barons Mendoza. And I am Mauricio Mendoza. We are actor producers. And co-owners of True Form Films and Shortcut to Hollywood. And we want to invite you to keep watching Kicking It With Mabel. That's right. <laughs> We're joined by Sam Chasen, an artist and native of Seattle, Washington, who is going to share with us some of his journey so far in the artistic world. From his early interest in street art, renaissance, impressionism, to an appreciation of modern art. Sam, welcome. Hi there. Thank you for having me, Mabel. This is going to be an interactive treat for our viewers. So I'm going to kick right off and ask, why painting? And I understand that more people have access to your work right now virtually. Yeah, well, I mean, it's COVID, so there's really not a lot of uh, opportunities for people to move around themselves, and lots of galleries are closed, and uh, so I just really made the push to post a lot on my social media, on my Instagram, and Facebook, and I have taken a lot of my art to the parks here in New York where I live um, to just show people on the street, you know, sort of a street gallery. That's wonderful. I see that next to you, you already, you're kicking us off already with one of your pieces of art. So share with us a little bit about that. So this is a commission that I'm working on for a family friend I've known for quite some time. And what you're seeing here is the underpainting where uh, I put down just a layer of like a base coat of color that I can paint on top of. Typically, painters don't start by painting on a, um, start the compositions on a blank canvas because uh, you can create more texture by having color you paint on top of. That way you can have the darks and lights show rather than just having the shadow show if you're painting, painting on straight white. We're going to paint on straight white later today because it's simpler, but what I do here with oils is I'm putting down a warm coat and then I'm blocking out the shadows with warm uh, browns, and this is actually a snowy landscape, like I said, up in the Alps. I actually have a um, this is what the sketch is. So let's see, you can see it. That was a little washed out. Basically, we have here, um, we have grids. So you can see this is how I translated this image to the large canvas. This is 30 inches by 40 inches. And um, what we have is uh, my family friends here uh, as the first two and their family members going off into the distance. Yeah, so this is the first layer. And now that it's dry, this is an oils. I'm going to go over with uh, the blues and, you know, start to uh, continue to build the canvas uh, from there. So a piece like this, about how long will it take you to work on? Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to say because I, I spend chunks of time on it over a long period. So right now, I mean, I've been working on this piece for about six or eight weeks, but um, a lot of that was doing the initial sketches, getting the final draft of the final piece down because this is a commission and I have to create a whole new um, piece. I'm not going to just tackle it from the painting. You know, I'm going to start off with sketches and make sure going back and forth that what I'm going to finally do is the final piece. And so now this has only been like, I would say on the painting about a few hours. Um, it'll probably be up to like 20 or 30 hours on just the painting, but it's taken 30 plus hours to get here as well. You mentioned oils. So uh, I'm a novice when it comes to painting. Do you, do you particularly like oils? And, and why is that? Is there something about the, the texture, about the way it appears in terms of the final product? So you'll see, um, I don't know, it's hard to say, like there's this vibrancy, this depth and complexity of color. Once you start layering on colors of, different uh, hues and saturation levels and um, light and dark tones. So I really like that with oils because you can create a, a piece you can really feel like you can go into. Um, and acrylics I like to paint with a lot as well, but for a complete, completely different reason in that I can create a piece really quick, it dries nearly instantly, and it has this very um, bright um, sort of pop-like appeal that um, it sort of pops off the page. So in a different way, it sort of grabs your eye and um, it's also you know fun to work with and um, you can get very sort of uh, almost cartoon or, or uh, like Andy Warhol-like stuff. It's very bright and like full colors. 
I know that your love for, for painting or just your interest in all of this started at a very young age, at the age of, the, at, you were about 16 or so? Yeah, so I've been painting for a long time and doing art for a long time. Um, and that's pretty much when I sold my first piece at 16. Uh, it was a piece to my neighbor. And then from then on, I had some shows where I started selling art and just sort of realized that I could make paintings and people would want to buy them. And that's really been the large part of my business for a long time is, you know, the moment I make a piece or a handful of pieces, people just want them. And before I can even get them into a gallery, people buy all my best work. Um, and yeah, you know, middle school, high school, always chose the art electives and up through college, tried to do other stuff. But eventually, you know, we had a cool art studio as part of the senior major and a trip to New York, which is one of the reasons why I'm here. So, um, yeah, I just never could never escape art. <laughs> so what was it about it? Is it the, the creative aspect of it? It's creating something new? What what motivates you? Yeah. Um I don't know. Since I was a kid I just, you know, doodled, right? You know, we were in class doodling or just at home and drawing cartoons because, you know, we didn't have smartphones, I guess, as a kid. We didn't I wasn't allowed video games for a while. Um it also gives me a lot of joy to be able to express myself in these ways. And whenever I'm in a position or in a role that I'm not able to do those tasks, I start to feel like this nagging itch to get back to those actions and activities. So, um, yeah, you know, it's partly because I can't stop and partly because other people want to see it. And, you know, it's a good combination, I guess. That's a lovely combination. <laughs> You shared with me off camera that one person that's inspired you is Oscar Claude Monet, the French painter. And I started looking, I started doing a little more research about Monet. I mean, I'd seen obviously some of his paintings at, you know, some of the museums in New York City. Um, but I found that light seems to play a big role in a lot of the pieces that he does. So I'm wondering when you're, you know, when you're working on your own art, do you ever try to channel individuals like him or other artists that that you admire? Oh, yeah, all the time. I mean, it's always like uh, any creative will tell you it's a fine balance between like getting inspiration and just straight stealing other people's things and putting it in your work in ways that like people, other people don't notice because it's all combined. Um, so, I mean, definitely like you can look at lots of my work and you'll find clear links between Monet or Van Gogh or other artists where I'm emulating brush styles or like a feel for a whole painting um, just because what I do love about nature is that um, it's so um, chaotic that you can really trick as a painter or a creator the, the human eye into thinking that what you're looking at is very real, even if it's just as crazy chaos, because when we look at the world, for the most part, what we see is chaos. Um, except for those, that one thing that our eye is focusing on. And um, also, you know, no one's going to go back and like double check your work against the photo that you're working against or the landscape. And so, um, you know, our eyes give a lot and, and our brains give a lot of uh, benefit of the doubt to the art, which then makes it fun. And um, as far as the light goes, yeah, like Monet, Rembrandt, you know, using all these dark tones to create a whole scene and then light and specific points to create a focal point in a way for your eye to move around the canvas and um, find places of calmness and activity and rest. I know that I probably wouldn't be able to, to figure that out. I won't be able to say, oh, wait, that's a Monet stroke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a Rembrandt, wait, I, I, I can see that. Uh, but no, that totally makes sense. So I love seeing this particular piece that you're working on. Do you have other pieces that you can share with our viewers? Yeah, for sure. sure. Um, we, we'd love to, we would love to get a sneak peek. Yeah, so lots of stuff on my website. You can see this is a little piece from my like Cannon Beach in Oregon at the Sea Stacks, um, a little uh, sunset against the water. And a lot of the reasons I paint nature is because it's something that we seem to, as a society, have gotten away from a little bit. Um, this is Texas and the Chisos Mountains. Um, you know, every time you go, every time you're around an amazing sunset, you always find people that are stopping and viewing the sunset. 
and people will always be amazed by sunsets and um, beautiful places. Um, and so I make a lot of this art to just showcase what a beautiful world we live in. This is also Texas. Um, so I went on a long cross country road trip to get to New York City from Seattle. I went on a big U drive all the way down to LA, then all the way across New Orleans and all the way up to New York City and um, stopped in many places along the way. And um, yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was beautiful. This Prospect Park in Brooklyn. We're loving it. And I know that our viewers are absorbing it as well. So I'm curious, you said you went cross country. So when you see something that you like, do you take photographs of it? Or I'm, I'm almost, a part of me is wondering, do you stop? Do you actually start drawing? Or do you take some images and you're thinking, oh, you know what? I can envision myself painting that later. It's both. Um, usually I take photos and, and then paint later just because uh, I'm just like out hiking and carrying all the stuff is busy and, you know, like, but this was like a little butterfly that, you know, flew around me when I was hiking in Yosemite, for example. And I was like, oh man, I'm definitely going to paint that little guy later. <laughs> um, or yeah, again, out in Prospect Park, you know, I spent, I was just living over in Flatbush in Brooklyn. So I spent a lot of time in Prospect Park. So, you know, like when it's winter and there's like all the ice in the water, it's just very calming and serene. Um, or yeah, driving across the country, uh, all up and down the West Coast, there's like very vibrant pink and purple flowers just covering the Northwest coastline. Um, and so eventually I had to stop out and take plenty of photos and was like, I'm gonna paint those later. Would you say that there's something distinct about your paintings? Uh, like I mentioned Bonet, he's known for his use of light. So you just mentioned like colors. There's some artists that they're, the colors that they use are just so bright and beautiful. So are there certain things that you would say are maybe part of your trademark? Yeah, I guess color probably, yeah. I definitely tend to use bright, vibrant colors um, and uh, with, with bold strokes, bold brush strokes. Um, uh, sort of like I like to have like, uh, I've recently started saying like an impressionist romantic combination where there are large parts of it that are like in the romantic style thin layers of paint to build up texture and complexity and then there are parts that are very impressionistic that are just sort of a brush stroke i'm not really worried about the realistic nature of these uh close-up scenes like for example in here it will be very very realistic on the foreground this character and this character and some of these areas over here um and then you'll also see like the realism in the uh mountain and the um cliffs and stuff but at the same time if you go up close you'll see the brush strokes and it won't be to a t perfectly like photographic and um uh so yeah i think people that that's something you would find in my work is that sort of like push and pull between something that looks very realistic but when you get up close it's like a lot of fun um detail work that's yet yeah, not like a photograph because that's that's too hard that's not really my style <laughs> so i'm curious when you're when you're about to start a painting do you need a particular ambience that you like to work in like do you dim the lights do you have to have bright lights do you have music <laughs> in the background perhaps a glass of wine <laughs> Really, it's just about time um, for me, uh, and, and light is nice. I like to work usually uh, in the mornings or daytimes. I'm not tired. Although, you know, if I get energetic and I have an idea and I'm excited, then I can work late as well. Um, it's just about, yeah, having the, the time, like at least one to two hours, really, for me to, like, get up to speed and get in the zone and in the flow of painting, and then an hour or two where I can continue and just – use that energy and keep painting um uh yeah because it's it's a lot of energy to get into the creative flow of things and so you don't want to like be stop start um that's really just how i feel about it and figuring out the light is nice like just making sure that the light on the canvas is even so that i'm not like dealing with crazy shadows that's not really the only thing <laughs> 
So for someone like myself, who's a novice when it comes to painting, are there a few tips that you can share and perhaps with some of our viewers? One is um, don't use white and black to highlight, to make things lighter or darker. Use only colors for the most part. Um, and if you're going to use any, either one of those two, you use white. Um, white is your friend, I guess, when you're pushing stuff into the background. And then when, if you want to use black, use at the very end to put the shadows on. Because if you mix it with your colors to make things darker, they'll get gray. And that's not what you want. Um, so that's one. I guess two is use a lot of mixing medium. So water or something else so that you're not using just pure straight color because you'll run out of color really quick and they'll be way too vibrant and the, the saturation will be way too strong. I mean, unless you're doing like a very pop art flat piece, you know, that's cartoon like or something, you don't want to be using just straight pigment. Um, mostly because the first point is very expensive. <laughs> um, you know, eight tubes of paint could be times eight, 64 bucks. And so if you use those paint, all that paint for one piece, you're going to be mad when you have to spend another $60 on your next painting. <laughs> So Sam, any chance that you can give us a one-on-one on basic painting? Yeah, um, I actually have a painting that I love to paint with you guys, and um, I have a... I think that would be great. Awesome, awesome. So give me a second to just get set up here. So viewers, this is going to be a treat. Sam is going to share with us some of the basics of painting. So in just a few minutes, he's going to tell us what tools we need. And uh, a quick fact, a fast fact that I learned that I thought was really interesting is I read that one of Monet's paintings sold for $110.7 million at a Sotheby's auction. And it, can't, it made me think, I wonder if he ever thought that one of his paintings would be worth that much. <laughs> so who knows, right now we're looking at the young Sam Chazen and in a few years, we may be spending several million dollars to get one of his paintings. So make sure that you share this, uh, this particular part of our interview uh, with friends, loved ones, especially during the holiday season. I think this might be a little gift, or as I would like to think, the gift that keeps on giving as we share with others how they can, th how they can start perhaps a new hobby and start painting. So in just a few minutes, Sam is going to share with us a few tricks of the trade, a few tips on how we can get started. And I thought I'd share with you, I started doing a little research about some artists that I think are interesting. And something I came across with Vincent Van Gogh, I have to say, I love the bright colors that he tends to use and the way the strokes of the brush appear on the, on the, on the canvas. So I'm wondering, this may be a good opportunity for you to look at some of the painters that you may like uh, once we are in a, in a safer place and can go to museums. Um, you know, take a glance, you know, go to your local museum. Uh, online right now, there's so many things that you can be watching uh, and, and develop an, an interest for the arts. Why not? Uh, we should always have an array of things that, that we turn to. And so I'm really looking forward to this because painting is something that I've been always a little curious about. So Sam, are you ready to fill us in? So I'm gonna start off by asking, what are the tools that we need? All right, so the tools we'll need are some brushes. And um, these are the brushes I have, but really you could make do with just a really big brush, a medium size, large brush, um, just like a medium one and let's see, let's go with a small one. Oops. Ah. <laughs> and a small one. So you could basically just go with these four. Um, so you could go with four brushes, large brush for covering large areas, medium, large for covering like your trees, this for getting your reflections, and this for getting some branches. Okay. Um, I will show the uh let's see, the paint. My paints are a little, uh, <laughs> little gross, but you need paint and you'll need a canvas. Um, this is the 16 by 20 inch canvas. 
very cheap. You can get a five pack of these, like 20 bucks. Would Maybe you recommend that people go to um, an art supply store? Yeah, so my favorite art supply store is Dick Blick, um, commonly known as just Blick these days. You can either order online or go to their stores. They have plenty. Um, so, yeah, although you'll find this stuff at any art supply store. So if there's an art supply store near you, um, you can find all this stuff there. I see um, that, obviously, you're using an easel. Is that really, like, essential? Or, like, would you recommend that people try painting on a on a desk or something? Or easel would be the ideal situation? An easel really is the ideal situation. You can get a small desktop easel for 10 15 bucks. This is a expensive large easel that I've had for about 15 years. It's like 200 something dollars, but it allows me to stand up and move around a little bit easier and create different sort of angles for myself um, and adjust for large canvases. So this is definitely more of a professional grade easel. Um, but if you're at home and you want to do some fun stuff, you can get one of these from even the dollar store nearby you. To the side here. Viewers, make sure to take notes if you'd like. <laughs> And okay. also be sure to share this particular interview with friends, family. So step one, you need a palette also as well. I didn't mention that. Um, you can either buy them or I like to use old Tupperwares from to-go places. So just clean them out and then you got a free container because all you need is something that stops the paint. When I was younger, I'd be bad and just use a plate if I didn't have one. <laughs> so you can do that if you don't like a plate and just be like, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to. Um, so what we did is we put some, let's see, we put some manganese blue and phthalo blue um, on here, two dollops, or one of each, and then we did a nice big dollop of titanium white, and so I mixed it up, it's kind of reflective here, so you can, but you can see like sort of a nice light blue, so that's what we're going for initially. Um, now I'm going to take my big brush. And we're just going to cover this whole area. Oh, I should also say what we're painting. So what we're painting today is this nice reflective water, lake, sunset. This is from Prospect Park. I took this the end of summertime. Um, and yeah, it's from you know a place I just moved from. I miss it. And this will make me feel good. So this is what we're painting today. But if you have taken a photo, Hopefully the lessons you learned here today will help you make whatever painting you like. So. We're ready, Sam. <laughs> All right. Ready, viewers? All right. Now, if you're ready, just follow me. Nothing too crazy, but we're just going to go sort of around this canvas. Make sure. You can hear me all right? Audio is good. We can hear. We can right. hear construction. We're paying close attention to taking <laughs> diligent notes. <laughs> All right. So we're just creating sort of like a light blue um, border around everything. Because it's the sky and the water. And so the nice thing about painting reflections is that, you know, you don't really have to worry about half the painting. because you're just painting it twice. <laughs> um, and they're reflections. So once you do one, you can just follow the other. And again, you don't have to worry about doing it perfect because we're doing nature. And nature is imperfect and weird and all sorts of stuff. Okay, so we got a nice blue down, nice light blue. Right now, I'm thinking like, Coloring. <laughs> Coloring right now is as close as I get to this. So normally, like, I'm trying to get, you know, stay within the lines and all. So I, I see that as you're using the brush, you're really just, I'm going to use messy, but that's not the word I mean. Uh, but you're not concerned about, like, you know, making sure you're going, you know, vertically or horizontally. So typically, is that okay? You said like that, it makes it look natural. So typically, is that what we should be mindful of? Yes. Yeah, so with this, when you're starting, and especially with your undercoats, you want them to be soft and blend nicely. And the way you get them to blend nicely is by doing these um, long strokes that 
sort of look messy, but are in all different directions. And, um, uh, you, you see the can like the brush coming, like hitting the canvas, going and then leaving the canvas rather than like staying and stopping on the canvas because that creates this mark at the end you don't want. And, and also you don't want them all in the same direction because then that creates sort of a mechanical look as, as if it's been applied by a printer or something. You want to do nice X's and circles and like some this direction and some this direction and up and down and an X and just sort of make it have a lot of variety because that's how the world looks. <laughs> um, out of that, I'm so structured and I like everything to be neat that that was yeah. the approach that I would take. I'm curious. So once you fill this, will you then continue to paint over it? Like how many, um, how many times will you paint over that? Like is 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 there a strategy to that or? So yeah, basically we're paint. We're just painting the whole underpainting right now, and we're gonna basically paint over the whole thing. Um. So right now we're gonna we we added a little bit of white. It's hard to see with all the reflections here. But I added a little bit of white here at the bottom, and I'm mixing it up to get a nice lighter blue. And I'm mixing it along the edges, and so this blue blends a little bit better into the um, canvas, and the it goes from a light blue into white. And so let me just mix a little bit of water so it's easier to mix. So now I'm just going along the edges. To our viewers, I hope you're taking diligent notes. <laughs> Pay close <laughs> attention. <laughs> All right, so now got a nice fade into white. Cool, cool. Okay, so now we're going to switch it up and go to yellow because the sun is got a yellow tint to it and it has that sort of golden evening glow. So we're going to put that in the center and do the sort of the opposite where we, um, Instead of going from the outward edge in blending, we're going to go from the center out, blending into what we just did. Um, so let's see. All right, so we're taking this time. We got white. You can't really see the white because it's on the white and yellow. And we're just going to mix them up with our palette knife, which you don't necessarily need, but is useful for mixing paint. This is a cadmium yellow, I'm pretty sure. Yep. All right, so now we've got a very pale yellow here. And so what we're gonna do is basically take our same brush. Maybe I'll take a, a different brush so it doesn't turn green. Hey Sam, I have a quick question for you. So mm -hmm. when I look at pictures of painters or on television, usually they have this this palette in front of them, like this round palette with a bunch of colors and they're yeah. you know, is that realistic? <laughs> like do painters actually use that? <laughs> it is. Um that's it's easier to do with oil paint because oil paint stays wet. Um and uh they're not using just Tupperware containers. Um, but I like to, uh, keep things, I, I like to reuse things and, you know, I got free palettes. I might as well use them. <laughs> um, okay. So right now, folks, what we're doing is putting in this yellow here where the sun is and we're blending it. We're just blending it into that white there. Um, so go ahead and just blend that into this white. Again, nice and easy, but you want to sort of do more horizontal ones all over at this point. So now we have our nice yellow blending into the blue. Okay, so where's our painting here? Or where's our photo oh, here? So now we've got our beginning layers. So next up, 
We're going to draw a little horizontal line for our horizon line and then do our clouds. As you can see, we've got dark blue here for um, these clouds, almost like a lavender or something. And that'll sort of block out where everything's going to be so that when we can, when we go in, we know exactly where to put all the pink and everything. All right. So let's go back to our blue palette. Oy. And so what we're gonna do, because those uh, clouds were a little bit dark, um, is not add black. What we're gonna do actually is add red and then a little bit of orange. Because blue and orange are complementary colors, when you add a complementary color to a larger color, whatever the color is you're using. So I have blue here, since I'm adding orange to it, what it will do is sort of bring it closer to gray. So it'll just knock down the saturation, but not to gray in the same way black does. Um, so it'll just seem not so vibrant blue. Um, and then red, because those clouds seemed a little bit lavender to me. And so just gonna add a little bit of that. So I have cadmium red here, adding a little bit of, and. I'm curious, how many versions of each color are there? Are there like 10 different variations of red, 10 yeah. variations of orange? <laughs> oh yeah, there's hundreds. <laughs> um, you, there's, you know, you spend a lifetime studying color and, and, uh, the differences and the subtle variations in color. Um, okay. So this is looking pretty good now. We got this sort of like kind of darker, almost, yeah, a little bit more purpley looking color. All right. So got the fun part starting. So you want to grab your, let's do a medium brush here. This is a small, sort of a smaller brush. Um, I got to make sure I have my uh, thing here. Wet my brush, put it in the paint. So just making sure I got some water in there so it lasts me a little bit. Um, all right, so our horizon line is just a little bit above the, the halfway line. So this is the halfway line of the painting. So we'll say the horizon line is like right here. So we're just gonna go ahead and draw the horizon line. And again, it doesn't really matter if it's imperfect. It just has to be generally straight because again, no one's, no one's going up to your painting with a ruler against this thing and that thing, you know, making sure it's perfectly level. So that's generally where everything is. All right. Um, let's do an outline of the, of the trees. So we, we're not painting where we don't need to be painting. Um, so the trees basically come in here. They come down. Do across. And then they come down like this. All right, so that's where the trees are. And the reflections of the trees are just this inverted, right? So this comes up. And I do little bouncies because the trees are all different. So you're just sort of bouncing your cam bouncing your brush along as you're painting. You're not really worried about doing every single little um, curve. Then this comes across and it bounces out and it bounces out. It comes like this. Okay, so that's roughly what we got. And then let's um, put our uh, clouds in. So I'm gonna do a little bit big river brush actually, um, just because it'll be a little bit faster. So this is a larger brush. Um, you at home, you could also use your medium brushes, or you could even use this brush at first. Um, you have our undivided attention. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. It's over here on my end. It might be something that I'll pick up in the new year. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Okay, everybody. So you can see here we got these clouds over here. We got these clouds. We got this cloud. 
um, reflection. So basically it's like, you got this sort of like one mark over here. You got this thing coming over this way. I'm just sort of outlining where the clouds are gonna be. Don't worry again about getting them perfect. Um, still seeming a little bit saturated for me. So I'm just gonna go ahead and add a little bit more orange and blue and maybe white. Um, okay, let me just mix this up here. So Sam, I have a question for you. You mentioned that if you make a mistake, we'll just paint right over it. But can you in fact do that? Like let's say you used a dark blue and then you change your mind and you want it to be a lighter blue. How would you adjust for that? So yeah, I mean, basically, yeah, is the is the short answer. You can paint right over it. Um, various paints are more transparent or, or opaque than each than other ones. And funnily enough, white is like the most opaque. So if you're having trouble, like for example, you painted something dark red or you know green or something, you want to paint a little yellow over it. Yellow is very transparent. So what you'd have to do is paint white, almost like white out over the areas that you wanted to fix and then go back in with your lighter colors. And you'd have to do a little blending to make sure that um, you know it blends with whatever was there before. But yeah, you certainly can paint over whatever you want. Um, so I did like kind of a darker blue and this is a lighter blue. Again, not too much lighter. So I might have to just bring this over here and get um, more yet more white. All right. And again, yeah, you can just at home, like if you like that blue, just keep painting with it. Um, okay. So that's a little bit better. Um, so we have this cloud coming here on the horizon. We have this cloud over here. And this sort of cloud shape over here. And these clouds. And then we have like this long cloud going out and this long cloud going out. And then this big cloud shape here in the center is really the, the main one. So this is where you're probably looking at and you're like, oh my God, like my thing looks crazy. I don't know what I'm doing, but just take a deep breath. Um, we'll be fine. This is where, you know, you're just sort of giving yourself marks here. So you're not painting the canvas, like getting one area perfect and then moving to the next inch because then your painting looks disjointed and you have like one area that looks really good. And then, but you're like, what is this whole area over here? So I work the whole canvas the whole time. Um, just to make sure that the whole thing is coming together as a whole complete piece. And like I said, in this step, we've just sort of outlined our clouds. Um, so let's just go back. So, or fill them in now. So we have this one over here. Let's we'll fill this in. And you can go over stuff, doesn't matter. We're going to go over it again. And there's... You can see these all these tiny clouds. We're not going to worry about getting them perfect. We're just going to make little marks, you know, and you can use the side of your brush a little to create clouds. This is a bigger one. So this is a thicker cloud. And these ones are kind of smaller marks, but I'm using a little bit bigger of a brush so that the mark itself creates a cloud texture. Um, never attempted to do paintings um i actually enjoy uh cartoon characters <laughs> oh nice it's completely different but it's <laughs> different because like when i draw like i'm trying to be so precise with each part of the drawing so this approach to me is like fascinating that you're like you said you're kind of all over the place but it makes sense uh while when i'm drawing or i'm sketching cartoons I'm so, like, I will take quite a while, and I don't do it frequently, with just, I don't know, let's say I'm creating, um, oh, I don't know, it could be a, a table, <laughs> or a table, or I'm placing something on top of the table. So this approach is, is interesting. Do you find that with most of the work that you do, so you enjoy landscapes? 
Mm-hmm. You work on other things besides landscapes? Yeah, all sorts of stuff. But I do a similar approach that I like have a very uh, imperfect uh, way of applying everything or kind of rapid and haphazard. <laughs> um, uh, Cause yeah, I just sort of like have more fun that way. Um, when I was younger, I used to be more into drawing stuff in the lines and, um, but I mean, even still, like, even when I would do those things, I was like, I can draw it in the lines, but now I'm getting bored of drawing in the lines. So I'll just get tired and draw it out of the lines eventually. <laughs> like, um, so, but I, yeah, I have other stuff. Um, for example, let's see, this is one that I've done recently. This is a portrait, um, sort of piece. And so like doing the people, like, but like, you can still see it's like a little frenetic and uh chaotic but still has a realistic quality to it um and then similarly i like to do some weird stuff so this is like i don't know a body thing (laughs) um with some landscape stuff in the background so as i've been building my style in the last few years i've been really trying to combine the fun landscape craziness some realistic and very clear and precise um areas and then you know the landscape nature natural feel so so that allows me to get back to another one of my favorite painters which is salvador dali who i don't know as everybody should know um had the some of the wildest paintings anyone's ever seen um and they definitely oscillated between things you clearly recognized and things that clearly didn't make any sense at all um with also lots of beautiful landscapes uh as a part of the pieces do you find this process to be relaxing? Because as I'm watching you, it's relaxing me. <laughs> yeah, it's it does uh, feel very relaxing for sure. Um, and it, you know, I think painting's supposed to be fun. And you know, for a long time, I was one of the reasons why I couldn't get started was that you know after college and um, you know learning a lot about modern art, I felt like oh man, like art's got to be this uh this statement about things and blah 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 and and i sort of didn't paint because i was overthinking the work and then it wasn't fun and then i wasn't interested in doing anything because i wasn't enjoying it and eventually one of my friends was like well if you like doing it just do it um eventually i realized that the landscape you know it's uh you know there's like the statement that like uh not all like art not all art is just pretty landscapes or something like that but uh which can seem to disparage landscapes but um i think there's a lot to landscapes and that you know we can just really especially now see what it is that we're missing in a certain sense um you know prospect park this scene in prospect park there's not many beautiful parks in new york city you know we have prospect park and um central park and there's forest park but you know there's like millions of people here and for there to be like three and a half large parks is a little bit (laughs) underwhelming i think as somebody who's from the northwest where i drive half an hour and i'm like eight thousand feet up in a mountain um so you know there's there's something that you know touches us especially in places that are highly urban about seeing these um natural scenes and it just makes us feel more connected to i think places we're not so connected to anymore and that's really important um as you know climate change is ravaging the globe and um people are uh starting to realize that these uh places and these things you know it'd it'd be nice to not have them disappear and have us realize how important they are once they're gone like many things we should hang on to them for our, for dear life because they give us life. Um, anyway, so we're doing the reflection now. So I'm sort of like looking here and making sure that I got this reflection properly down. It's really so. great to see the process because we went from the yellow and now we're really starting to see the clouds. We're starting to see it come together. Yeah. Um, Definitely. And this is a really beautiful uh, reflection here just because the water is so still. But what you can do to like increase the feeling of this being water is just do like streaks, you know, 
because and and let's see, I can get my smaller brush here. I should probably do that. Um, especially as it gets to the uh, horizon with the water, you can see over here you start to see really some clear lines. Let's just sort of just draw some lines. So yeah, you can see the reflections. And yeah, keep in mind, this is gonna be the dark area. So yeah, this is pretty close. And again, if I were doing this in oils, it would probably take me a lot longer because I would be blending everything and building up rich color depth and, um, but the nice thing about acrylics is that I can finish this whole thing in the next like half, you know, 20 minutes. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna go back in here and just like do some dollops for the clouds. The clouds are fluffy. So let's just use our round brush in here and make some fluffy clouds. You know, as Bob Ross says, nice happy clouds. Just do some nice do fluffy ones. Do you paint on a regular basis? Like, is it something that's part of your normal routine? Yeah, I, you know, I try to paint at least once a week um, if I'm not busy with stuff. Um, oftentimes I do much more than that, two, three times a week. Um, sometimes once a day, depending on how much, how busy I am with everything. Um, but yeah, it's really something that I really try to... Uh, make part of my yeah like daily routine or just general routine some some form of art really whether it's painting or uh drawing or something else um okay so now we have our sunset gradient we've got our cloud um uh clouds blocked in our cloud shadows um now let's go ahead and fill this area in, which is gonna be fun and simple. <laughs> um, all righty, let me just. I love how you said simple, <laughs> simple to you. <laughs> We're um, so yeah. a little trouble. <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> um, okay, so. I'm just gonna be... doing my best to absorb all of the concepts and then I'll be watching this back a few times. <laughs> good, good. Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, so I'm just adding some more phthalo blue, some red, and um, let's see, and some green, phthalo green. So like I said, I try not to use black as much as possible um, up until the point that I absolutely have to. So let's just see what I can get here. I might need to use some black right now, though. Um, so Sam, I'm curious, um, and our viewers may be curious, a painting, let's say this one in particular, how much might it run? Uh, so this one would probably be anywhere from like 150, 200. Um, and then do you frame it or it's the canvas itself? Um, let's see, yeah, no, I just usually do the canvas itself. You can frame it if you like, for sure. But I typically just, you know, it has these uh, wooden pieces on the back. So I just put one nail or two nails in the wall and boom, good to go. Um, let's see, so this, I was gonna do the green actually, but um, we should wait for that to dry and we'll do our pink first. So now we're gonna do the pink. As you can see, there's lots of pink. <laughs> um, and that's the far background. So before we do the foreground, we gotta do the background. So the final bit of the background is pink. So red and white. Um, let's go ahead and mix these babies up. Put some water on our brush. And just, we really just need like the tiniest dab of red. I probably put way too much red here, but keep that in mind when you're working with um, white is that all you need is the tiniest touch and all of a sudden you get the hue in there. 
Um, this is kind of a warm pink here. So we should probably add a little bit of orange and yellow. Maybe just a little bit of yellow, actually. So it's almost I'm like curious, a... Since you, we, we both live in an area with all the seasons, do certain seasons, and because of you like because you like natural landscapes, do some inspire you more than others? Like, do you like summer more than spring or autumn or winter? Like, I'm thinking personally, I would love winter with the snow scenes. Yeah, I mean, I, I love them all honestly. Like, there, I do like out here that there's more snow and um, there's the different sort of just natural environment you know like in the northwest everything stays green all the time so even in the winter all the leaves are on or all the all the trees are pine trees pretty much and so all the leaves are still on all the trees um where out here all the trees are not for the most part and so all the trees are bare um which is definitely different so like in prospect park it's very brown and blue versus you know just green and brown um, where i'm from so i like that and so now we're just going to go over it. So we've got all this blue. And like I said, we're going over it. Um, let's see. We got this one cloud here. And we got sort of this one. Um, keep in mind, these are going to mostly be on the like bottom side because the you know they're getting lit from below right and so the pink's going to be on the bottom side of the clouds um and here they're going to be on the top sides of the clouds because they're the reflection of the sun so sky pink on the bottom water pink on the top um and because we've mixed our pink with white it's pretty opaque so it sits on top of this blue pretty nicely I'm gonna use a smaller brush. Ugh. Sammy, you seem like a natural when it comes to, to teaching. Have you done this before? Yeah, I was a paint and sip instructor actually in, in New York for a short period of time. Um, and I've been painting for so long now that I have to teach myself and remind myself when I'm painting. So I'm really just sort of like, it sounds like I'm teaching you guys, but I'm just talking to myself <laughs> to make sure I'm doing it right. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so now we just, we, we've already done, like I, I can keep looking at this, but that might even just throw me off because now I should just focus on what I did here and add the pink to that so it looks right, right? So if I put like pink over here where nothing is, it might look a little weird. I mean, there is a few, but it's not too crazy, but it looks really correct when I put it on the bottoms of these blue shapes here. Um, and sometimes you blend it a little bit but if you wanted to have like some, you know, more um, evocative look, you don't blend too much all the time with these clouds because sometimes they're they're like really clear marks. Um, and you know, it's nice to do the lines and fill in here. Let's just fill in a little bit. Now we have. A uh, beautiful landscape. <laughs> we love it. <laughs> <laughs> so where can our viewers now see this finished product? Because it's going to be exciting for them that we got to see the whole process. And, and truly, that was so cool. Thank you for sharing that with us. We got, to, yeah. we got to see the white canvas and now this beautiful painting. Now it's done. Um, yeah, this, this will be on my website, uh, samuelchazen.com, just my name, uh, slash shop. Well, Sam, thank you so much for, uh, I, I think a little evolution occurred also <laughs> during this segment. And it, this was such a treat for myself, and I know definitely for our viewers. And I definitely want to, again, share with our viewers share this video, you know, share this interview with others. Uh, we got literally a one-on-one -on -one course uh, with Sam Chazen, who shared with us how to create this beautiful painting from acrylics. He shared with us the tools. He shared with us techniques. So definitely the gift that will keep on giving. 
So Sam, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. Um, a, a significant amount of time that you took, although for you, this was rather fast. For me, I would probably be working on this for a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's fine. Like I said, sometimes I work on pieces for weeks at a time. So there's no time frame. Um, just enjoy it. Oh, uh, Sam, thank you so much. We really appreciate it and just continued success. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me and um, I hope you enjoyed watching. Thank you. It was a pleasure.